Welcome to another episode of That's Some Crazy Shit with Kelly and James. I am Kelly and my co-host is Mr. James. What's up, buddy? I am here. You know, it's cool. How are you doing, my sister? I am doing very, very well. Um, so, you know, and people listening know that this show is called That's Some Crazy Shit. And you know that sometimes we talk about the paranormal. And sometimes, James, the paranormal can be hard for people to grasp as a real thing. Right. right? But when you have somebody who has a PhD in spiritual studies and can kind of put science behind it, I think you can get a better grasp of what it is that they're saying. Would you agree? Yes. And then, in fact, I I like it when we have guests who have a scientific background that can come and explain the quote unquote paranormal because, and we've talked about this, I don't know how many times there are some people who will not accept the stuff that's happening without quote unquote science behind it. Oh my God, you must be psychic because our guest is exactly one of those people. See? That that has a PhD in this stuff, has had a a um, spiritual experience herself. Her name is Reverend Karen Herrick. She has her PhD. She is also the director of Center for Children of Alcoholics in Red Bank, New Jersey. And she has a master's degree in social work, which she got from Rutgers University. So I would think she's well qualified. She's written a wonderful book, James, called Psychology of the Soul and the Paranormal. Perfect. And she talks about a lot of stuff. She is the perfect guest because she's got that science background that you're talking about and has really delved in and done years of research on this stuff. So yep. I thought she would be the perfect guest. Want to go ahead and bring her on? Let's do it. Welcome to the podcast, Reverend and Dr. Karen Herrick. Hi, Karen. Welcome to That's Some Crazy Shit. How are you? I'm good, thank you. And you? Good, good. Uh, I'm glad you're here. Kelly and I have lots of questions for you. Um, We want to talk about, your book is called Psychology of the Soul and the Paranormal. Is that correct? That's right. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about your book and how you went about writing this? Okay. Um... It's uh, a result, really, of my PhD work. Um, I, I had a spiritual experience where I felt another breath come in into my body while I was doing holotropic breath work, which is a psychological um, method that uh, takes you to an altered state. And um, I, I wasn't sure about God. I had this feeling that, kind of like the Indians, American Indians, that um, something was responsible for nature. And I didn't know what that was, but I believed in that and the wind. And um, so anyway, I went to this training for eight days and part of it was laying down and breathing. And so I went through this breath work where I experienced this breath. And then I also experienced my original birth, which was a lot harder than I think dying is going to be. Um, so anyway, I had this experience. I didn't know what it was. Um, I drew a mandala, a Jungian picture afterwards. and. Um, then we went to lunch and then everybody, there was like 11 or 12 people that had experienced this and the other 11 or 12 had been sitters. Nobody mentioned having a breath come into their body. <laughs> and uh, so I didn't talk about it. And it took me a couple years to realize. Um, and mainly when I read Bill Wilson's account of when he, um, the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, when he got down on his knees and he prayed, if there was a God take away my desire to drink, and he said um, in the hospital room, uh, it lit up and this um, air of spirit, not of breath went through him. And I thought that's what happened to me. That was spirit. So so anyway, then, uh, but right after my experience, I started getting people with very weird experiences that came in as clients. And um, so I thought, and they're not lying to me. I thought, wow, if um, they're having this, I had this. So I decided to get a PhD in spiritual psychology, which was 
studying William James, who's the father of American psychology, and Carl Jung, um, who um, then they both studied mediums and believed in altered states of consciousness, and um, and that's what transpersonal psychology is. It's it's other states other than our normal waking states. Um, so anyway, I I. Um, I gave lectures and studied about 135 people uh, who were mental health professionals and they had had spiritual experiences, most of them. And so had their clients. And so um, anyway, that really surprised me. And uh, from there, I decided to really go into mediumship and study that because um, when people were in chronic grief, if I sent them to a medium that I recommended, they came back and, and the grief was like 60% gone because number one, the loved ones, you know, were so happy that they came and they wanted to talk to them and they didn't want them to be in this grief because actually it holds the spirit back on the other side, the more that you grieve. Um, <clears throat> so then I, I started studying mediumship and went to Lilydale uh, up by Lake Erie, which is a town of mediums. And um, it was there that I found the, um, the, the picture of the vagus nerve that's on my book, um, which looks like this. And <clears throat> I had been studying the vagus nerve from another a gentleman, uh, Dr. Porges, who had studied the vagus nerve for 40 years. And it has to do with panic and anxiety. So you have, this is the longest nerve in your body, comes in at the top of your head, goes around your neck, down into your heart, down into your stomach. And Darwin founded it in 1790s, um, I think. And um, he called it the pneumogastric nerve. And he said that it connected your stomach with your brain and then your heart rate either went up or down, depending on what you were feeling. And that's true. And so when I was talking to clients about it, other, you know, usually you can say, well, if you're depressed in the morning, you need to do some exercise or take a walk. Um, but now I could say you have this nerve and it's your responsibility to get this nerve going in the morning. So we're gonna walk, we're gonna sing, we're gonna listen to music, uh, we're gonna hum, we're gonna do all these things that will activate your central nervous system with the vagus nerve. And they would do that mostly because, oh, I have this nerve now. So it's like I have something that I can really control and I can make better. So they were, you know, they were responding to that. Then when I went up to um, Lilydale, uh, I saw this pic these pictures um, in this museum in this three ring binder. And I, I didn't show you the one, but the body's laying down and the, there's a cord from the stomach and a cord from the neck. And I'm thinking to myself, that's the vagus nerve. I bet that is. <laughs> and so I said to the guy, uh, the, the curator, I said, uh, can I take a picture of these? And, oh, sure. It's just nobody's looked at that in 30 years. Oh, good. OK, so so I'm looking at it and um, it's just a, you know, a psychic way to explain um, the vagus nerve, which is the mind body connection and also is the way that your soul leaves your body, um, usually when you're going to die our so-called die when you're going to go to the other side. Um, but also now people are having out of body experiences and your death experiences. So you leave your body and come back now. So we need more to know about the vagus nerve, which also has a silver cord wrapped around it, which is an invisible cord that activates your chakra system. So I got interested in all that and I thought, you know, I ought to write about it. <laughs> so I yeah. did. It's <laughs> fascinating. Yeah, it, it, yeah you, you, you mentioned um, near death experiences. We've had psychic mediums come on and have had near death experiences trigger their abilities. That's right. Um, why do you think that is? Well, because they go to an, an, another state of consciousness, the fourth dimension, and they probably have this. Well, of course, Christ said, we. I thought he, I think he was a medium and a psychic. And he said, we all could do this. And there's some mediums that say, well, you could do it. Yeah, sure. Well, <laughs> you know, I'm not ready to do it yet. But anyway, um, I think they have this latent ability. And then when they have the near death, which probably I would think is on their in the, on their sole purpose path, that they're supposed to find us out. Um, so they go up there and they come back. Or, you, you know, they could fall down the stairs and hit their head or be in a car accident and hit their head. And that seems to be another way that these um, experiences come into them or the mediumistic abilities. 
it's absolutely fascinating how um, you talk about the vagus nerve and the chakra system. Because when you were talking, I thought, well, that sounds like the the how the chakras are aligned up. So is the vagus nerve, it's not, are the vagus nerve and chakras the same thing? No, no, not the same thing. Because chakras are invisible. And um, I, you know, I don't know if I talked about last time, uh, but I'll talk about it now that we have three metaphysical systems that are always going around us and working with us. And so the first is our sensory reality. We're, we're on the internet tonight and we know that and we could all see that. And it's a past, present and future in this reality. Then there's the clairvoyant reality, which is where near death experience happen, out of body experiences, um, where the Holy Spirit comes into you. Um, different uh, mystical experiences that have been had by saints throughout the centuries. Um, and in the clairvoyant reality, you, you can have all kinds of things like telepathy and meditation and um, uh, contemplation, all these different things that we do to get ourselves into a more mystical state. But usually what happens in that state is only one person has the experience and only one person sees it. Um, <clears throat> then there's a try, um, the, um, the next, um, cycle is uh, that I call it the trans psychic reality where miracles happen or people get cured of cancer, you know, in three days or whatever. Um, those kinds of things happen in another reality, but James and, um, uh, Carl Jung believed that all these realities were going on at the same time. And, and they didn't really maybe even have names for them then. But, um, so, uh, Jung's mother was a medium, a psychic. And, um, he was, she had lost a baby before Jung was born. So had like a two year old who passed away. And James said the same thing, lost a toddler son about the same age. And, um, anyway, when, when Jung was born, I think she would have been kind of a helicopter mother because she'd already lost a baby. And he was kind of a sickly kid, you know, probably a little weird um, by our standards now and read a lot and stayed home and was really good in school, um, but was probably not very social. Um, anyway, um, so he said his mother was a pretty good mother, but that every once in a while, she'd go off and say something that had nothing to do with the conversation. <laughs> You know, so you just kind of put up with that. And then at night, you couldn't go in her bedroom or he didn't because he said there were all kinds of voices and sounds coming out of there and he wasn't going in there. So so I think Jung was really interested in psychological states because he had lived with this. His father was a minister. He said his father he wasn't, um, he said something about he was more like an inferior woman, meaning very passive and not very assertive. Um, and, um, and then William James, Mrs. James went to a medium in uh, Massachusetts and um, ha asked William James to go with her and uh, said, you know, because they wanted to know where their son was. And, and then Lenora Piper became his white crow who they studied for like 25 years. I mean, how long do you have to study a medium to realize they're not, you know, fraudulent? And they put sand in her mouth. They did all kinds of stuff to her and she put up with it. Um, but she was like 85% accurate, which is, you know, very wow. good. Yeah. So anyway, they all studied this, but if you go take a psych course, you don't hear that, which I think is wrong because psychology studied mediums and they were interested in it. And, you know, the spiritualist religion from the 1840s to like, let's just say 1910, like 20% of the population were having seances and, and trying to talk to their deceased relatives. And we have research from all those years, of story after story. And um, and we just ignore that. Why you know, do you it's think that it's is? It's not just that, it's just not that field. You know, sometimes science wants to turn a blind eye to that evidence and it's like, this is what you ask for and it's there. You just shouldn't ignore what, you're, what you want, you know? Well, but science says that you have to be able to repeat this in a laboratory. Right. So no, that's, um, so what I'm saying is we have to um, research this and, and prove it at a different standard than that. Because number one, we need clairvoyant researchers. We need mediums to work with therapists. And um, you know, the, the spirit the spiritist tour is a religion, not a religious philosophy in Brazil, South America, it's really big in Brazil. 
they have centers where you can go and if, if you're sick or if you have, let's say at 18, you have a schizophrenic break, they have a whole team, doctors, nurses, but they have a medium. So that a medium talks about their past lives or you know what's happened to them in that way, clairvoyantly. Well, we need that kind of research uh, that includes clairvoyant researchers who can see the uh, silver cord and, um, and know when we leave our body. You have mentioned past lives. So is it the is it that everyone has had a past life or past lives? I'm not sure about everyone, but many. So um, but how do you how do you find out if you've had a past life? No, that's a whole other topic. <laughs> <laughs> Cause you said but one, one of the ways is uh, the easiest way is, um, are you are you in love with some historical time period? Like I love England and um, uh, Queen Elizabeth's time, Henry VIII's time. And I had ancestors at that time. In fact, one of my ancestors was the um, the banker for Queen Elizabeth I and, and then the James I and then Charles I refused him his pension. So I have a feeling I was there then uh, because I have a lot of memories, in, um, intuition about England then. Um, so, so what do you like and now, now like the Orient, I, I don't really ever want to go to the Orient. So maybe I had a bad past life there. I don't think so, but that, that could be an indicator. You go to a museum and you fall in love with these clothes or this furniture, right? So why, why do you have that attraction? Why are you drawn to that? Right? Yes. And then another good thought is, is there something in this life is there something that you had thought about in this life that has nothing to do with this life? Hmm. Okay, okay, that's interesting. I think past lives are interesting. Oh, I think so too, yeah. So, so in all the things that you've studied and your book is called Psychology of the Soul, you know, what What can you tell us about the soul? Cause I don't, you know, what, what is the definition of the soul? Oh, I, I think the soul is your life and lifetime patterns, okay? That's just a basic uh, description. And Carl Jung believed that your whole purpose of this life was to discover the purpose of your soul in this life. Uh, so how were you to do that? Um, and I explain, I have a chapter, of course, I think a couple of chapters in here about the soul and my soul journey so that you can kind of see how, how it goes along. So first, uh, he had five layers in the unconscious, where Freud just said the unconscious had to do with sexuality and your family memories, and lots of sexuality. And Jung, that's why they broke off. They were friends for six years, and then Jung said, people have more in their unconscious than sex, right? Well, Freud wanted to make this a science, so he didn't want anybody arguing with him. Um, anyway, so they broke off after six years because Jung wrote a book that said that. I don't buy the sexuality thing in the unconscious. And he said, we have five layers in the unconscious. The first layer is your life. What happened to you? Second layer, your parents' lives. What happened to them? Third layer, um, your uh, DNA, your ancestors. So he did genealogy charts and he had encouraged you to do a genealogy chart if you were in therapy. Fourth layer, <clears throat> your culture or your country. How has that affected you? And then a fifth layer is your soul slash self. So when you come into therapy, you have a conscious, like we're tonight talking consciously, and you have an unconscious. And in that unconscious are like little round islands called complexes. And those complexes, you could have a mother complex, father complex, incest complex, inferiority complex, just everything we name a complex. And that's like a little mountain down there, right? So the more that we work consciously and you talk about your feelings with me, you cry, we do, we hit the, the ottoman with a bat, we, we just do all kinds of things to evoke feelings, that unconscious, you're starting to bring all that up. And that's the whole point of therapy, bring it all out, not all, but most of it, and the, the important parts. And then your self slash soul starts to come up because it has room then. Interesting. Absolutely fascinating. That is. It is. And so tell us, in, in, your, in the other part of your book is called the paranormal. So what do you consider to be the paranormal? 
Well, that's what people would call, um, you know, going to a psychic or a medium or, or, or me feeling another breath, you know, or they might even call it craziness, you know. Um, so anything really that you, you would call spiritual, some people would call paranormal. Karen, did, did your research at all touch upon like, like ghost or anything like that? So, oh, sure. So what, what did you find out about ghosts? Like, why are there ghosts? Did your research talk about that at all? Like, why are they here? You know, I have this written down so nicely. Um, one of the reasons, um, I want to go back just one minute okay. to the clairvoyant reality. So then how would all of us get into the clairvoyant reality, right? Other than meditation and, you know, if we had a telepathic moment with, you know, somebody we care about or don't care about. Um, uh, okay, we could make an appointment <clears throat> to see an astrologer, a numerologist, uh, someone who does the I Ching, someone who does tarot cards. We can make an appointment with a psychic or a medium. So those things. So we make the appointment in the sensory reality, right? So we just call, we make the appointment, we show up. And it, it seems to us like the information is coming from the sensory reality. You know, she or he is talking to us, we're getting all this. But in that in that moment, you're, you're really in the clairvoyant and the paranormal because you're getting information from the other side. And um, I believe the unconscious is the ground of the spiritual or the paranormal. And so <clears throat> you get all this information. They mention different possibilities that you never thought about. And, and when you leave, you feel better. In fact, you feel happy because the clairvoyant reality is being in the now, right there in the moment. And you're getting uh, um, like extrasensory information. So because that happens, um, and I've had that happen where I've driven away from a psychic reading and um, I said, you know, Karen, you have no idea if any of that's going to come true. You know, So why are you so happy? I don't know. I just feel good. And so I say, well, I don't drink or smoke. So that's what I do. I go to psychics, right? <laughs> and <laughs> because it's fun and it has opened up a lot of possibilities for me, different thoughts. And then they'll always come in. I have three children and I have eight grandchildren and I have three great grandchildren right now. And uh, they'll mention something about, oh, what about so-and-so? Now, I wouldn't think to ask about any of those because no, I mean, they're not unless they're having a problem of some kind. So you get also information about your family members because maybe your grandmother or whoever is over there wants you to know that. So even if you don't go to a medium, you get other information. <clears throat> So back to ghost. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I thought now she's got to go so, back to what she is. Got to go back to ghost because this is I really want to know like why okay. are there why why do you think there are ghosts? Okay. Wait a minute. So when you're so called dead and you go to the other side, right? Right. Okay. So when you go to the other side, you become a spirit. There's a difference between a spirit and a ghost. I think spirits are just people without physical bodies. Okay, spirits can't talk, but they, they give us thoughts. And then some people who pick up on these thoughts are called psychics and mediums. So I've had people tell me that, um, like this one woman, when I first started my research, she said, um, she lives in this, you know, um, in the woods in New Jersey, and she wakes up sometimes at night and the end of her bed is this like colonial couple. And when she goes to push on her husband to see if he could see them, there's like this force field. She can't touch her husband. Wow. <laughs> and these and these ghosts, uh, these ghosts, because they don't talk, they don't give her thoughts. They stand there, and she said they look very disapproving. So she said the only thing I can think of is that um, you know maybe we did something to the property or the, something was done to the property before we bought it, and they're very unhappy, right? So she said, I don't know why. I said, well, did, this was after that movie, you know, Ghost. I said, well, did you ask them why they're there? No. Well, why don't you ask them? <laughs> <laughs> you won't know unless you ask. <laughs> and, you know, that seems to be it. If you do ask them, they will send you a thought. Um, but, you know, spirits that you're con contacting through a psychic and a medium, they, they want to talk to you. And, of course, they give thoughts to the psychic and the medium who has bigger chakras, number one, than we do. So that's why they get more energy to allow this material to come in. 
But don't you think everybody has the ability to get, I guess, messages or downloads from, oh, from sure. spirit? Yeah, it calls intu- intuition. intuition. Sure. So that's what right? your intuition is. Your intuition, I think so. you're saying, is a download from spirit. Absolutely. And we've talked about that with several, several guests, that exact thing. And that's yeah, interesting and- because I think a lot of people kind of don't pay attention to their intuition. No. Well, they don't, you know. And I have a neat story about that because I started to after this. Um, I was at a conference in New York City and I had a friend, and you know, you take all your best clothes and jewelry and all that. And we went down to um, um, lower Manhattan to have lunch. So we're parking the car, we found a spot. And I'm thinking, this car is gonna be robbed. And I said, you know, I don't think we should stay here. Let's go to New Jersey and have lunch, you know. Oh no, what are you talking about? We got a parking spot and everything, you know? So we go and we eat and we come back and, you know, forgot all about that, went home, opened up the trunk, it was completely empty. So I thought about that. My computer, my nice jewelry, all this stuff is gone. And I thought, you know, that voice should have been louder. <laughs> and then I thought, no, Karen, you should pay attention more. <laughs> So How then many I of start, us don't do that, though? I know, right? Well, because we're not aware. It's, you know, I'm aware now almost every day that, oh, okay. All right, is that a sign? Now, so if I get something three times, it's not my thought. I figure, okay, it's a sign of some kind. Maybe I'll do it, you know? That's so funny because I said the exact same thing earlier. And it will come to me where I'll get a thought. Like, for example, the other day I'm in the bathroom. I'm washing my hands and I get this thought about James. And I'm like, why am I thinking about James? And so I just kind of put it to the side, but then it came back to me again. And I'm like, right. okay, so why, why am I getting this? And so I thought, oh, you know, whatever. But when it came to me a third time, I was like, why am I getting this information? And a voice said, call him. And I was like, okay, right? So I called him and I told him the story. And he was like, that's so funny. Cause I was just thinking, about the thoughts that you were getting at that same time yeah. and then you called me i was like yeah. that was so weird i was like why and i was like this is just dumb but i just when it came to me for the third time and the voice a voice in my head just said call him and i was like oh okay i'll call him and i said and when i called him i said this is gonna sound Wait. really strange <laughs> but <laughs> and that's and it turned out to be a crazy story on its own yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> so I believe that. I totally believe if you get it three times, it's something that you need yeah. to pay attention to. Well, and I think their thoughts are electric. And that's how they send them to us so fast. And also, you know, uh, spirits, uh, if they want your attention, they'll be fooling with the lights and shut off your television. And so they fool with electricity also to, you know, <clears throat> to make you crazy, to pay attention to them. Wow. And how many investigators have we talked about, Kelly, that have had their instruments drained, their batteries drained, or even their selves, you know, they they feel drained. Yeah. I think they want, I think they want to show you what they can do, Um, but because there's no direction, they don't come with directions, um, (laughs) you know, we're not clear what they're doing, right? But um, what I say is, you know, sometimes my computer goes nuts. And if you've had some kind of a spiritual experience, they say that you you do that, your energy can mess up the computer. But now I'm starting to think, is it them? Um, and okay, if you're gonna tell me something, don't mess with my computer today, because I got stuff to do. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm talking the to them all the time now. Owners. Yeah. <laughs> that is funny. Yeah. Karen, yeah. thank you so much for being <laughs> on the podcast and sharing it. I gotta say, it, it's some crazy shit because you're right. You can't duplicate it in a lab. Nope. No way to study it. It's not tangible, nope. right? So, and, and it just, it, it fits the crazy shit realm perfectly. Yeah, I'm good. I'm so glad you asked me to come on. <laughs> yes, I'm so glad you decided to come on. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. Oh, you're entirely welcome. <laughs> You know, I, like I said in the opening, I love it when we have people with scientific background come and tell us that the 
quote unquote paranormal is real. You know, because you, how many times, if, oh, well, you can't, you know, it's not real because, you know, science doesn't say, well, yeah, well, now you have science saying. Well, she said even like young and, and other psychologists studied mediumship. Yeah. And I didn't know that about young until today. You know, I didn't know about about that either. You know, studied mediumship and there's all these years and years and years of research that she just just that she has done before yeah, she wrote the book. Right. And, and her, it makes you wonder how much is out there that we don't know about and is it being suppressed? Or people just don't want to talk about it. Right. So that's why we're here. To talk about it. And people like Karen who have taken it upon themselves to to get educated and do research and really find out about it and she said you know you can't duplicate it in a lab we need no. another way to study it we need another way to do it and what that way is i don't know but yes i agree with her yeah this you know somehow science has to evolve the scientific method because we talked about it when we talked about skinwalker ranch you cannot replicate the stuff that happens in a laboratory over and over again. You're right. lucky if you can catch it on instruments, much less replicate it. Yeah, that is you know? true. So at some point, science is going to have to evolve and change its thinking because there's some right now things can't be explained with science. It's, and that doesn't mean they're not happening. It just means that they can't explain it, you know. Right. So what was the breathing that she said she did? Oh, no, I'm not sure if I say this right. Holotropic? And so, mm -hmm. and that's breath work where people are breathing uh, rapidly or whatever, and they say this type of breath work can alter your your consciousness, altered states. Right. And, you know, that's how she had her experience um, from doing that type of breathing. Let me ask you a question, James, and this will be our random bullshit. Would you ever try or take training for that type of breath work? You know, I would, because when we've talked about plant medicine and we've talked about ayahuasca, okay, so you're using plant medicine to reach this same state of mind, state of being that you can use through just breath work. So I think someone like me who was hesitant to go and try ayahuasca because there's some, I mean, there's some crazy stuff that come with it, you know, throwing up and all that stuff, you know, you're purging your body of all that stuff. Where if you don't have to go through that, if you can achieve that same thing through breath work, I would do it. I do the breath work. So holotropic breath work is a therapeutic breathing practice that is intended to help emotional healing and personal growth. It's said to produce an altered state of consciousness. The process involves breathing at a fast rate for minutes to hours. Yeah. See, there it is. There's no mention of vomit, throwing up, anything like that. So that appeals to me. Mm, I think it would be hard to breathe at a fast rate for hours. Well, well but minutes. you're not going to start doing it for hours to begin with. Right. Well, that's true. That's true. I'm just saying. Um, something to think about. I've never tried it. It would be nice to have somebody, if somebody knows more about it, to come and explain it to us because there's all types of different breathing or breath work techniques yeah. that they that are out there that we really haven't covered in that some crazy shit. And I would like to learn more about it because it seems that these different types of techniques can put you in an altered state. Well, that would be a good segue because we could have Karen come on and tell us what she knows and then maybe we could find a guest to tell us about some of these other techniques. So yeah, that's maybe somebody out shows. there, maybe somebody out there in podcast man, land knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows something about this breath work. And if, and you, if do, you do, where could they reach us? www.thatsomecrazyshitpodcast.com And it's all there. Bios, uh, blog, past episodes there's a contact form you can get a hold of us if you have a story you want to share with us 
You could come on and tell it, share it. If you want me or Kelly to read it, we'd be glad to do it. We're here for you to share your stories, people. Yep. So, James, next week we have another guest. Well, no, actually, we don't have another guest next week. I think next what? week it's going to be me and you, no? Or another guest. We can edit this out. This is episode 12. What do you want to do? Well, we usually go 13. We could have our closing episode and save the next episode for the next season. So we have two more that we're recording. So one of those will be the ending episode number 13. No, let's us do it. I didn't know we had two more. So we could do our ending episode and then have those next two be next season. Yes, but what are we going to do it on? When will this air? March. January, February, March. March. Well, I guess it really doesn't matter. We have to think of it. We don't. We can edit this out, but we need to think of a, a topic. All right, we'll just stop recording. Well, hold on. Oh, what are we doing? All right, James. So until next time. Oh, keep your minds open, people. <laughs>